Hello, very nice to be here. I've never been to Port Lincoln before and I feel a bit embarrassed about that because I am born and bred in South Australia. I live in Bowhanna in the Adelaide Hills and um, I went for a walk on the jetty first thing this morning, took a photo and oh my God, it's very beautiful. Like I talk a lot about self-care. If you live in Port Lincoln, you're ticking a lot of the self-care boxes straight away. So that's cool. Um, so hang on a second, I've just got to learn to use the equipment. Right, that's me. So as KP said, um, I'm a psycho-oncologist. That's just sexy language for a clinical psychologist who specialises in cancer-related distress. I work um, Monday to Thursdays in my private practice in Kensington in Adelaide, and eight till six, and I just do cancer. So I talk about cancer all day, every day. So today I'm gonna to talk to you from three perspectives, from the theory of psycho-oncology, from my clinical practice, and also from my personal experience. A long time after I started doing the work in cancer, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer in 2018. And I also lost my parents and all four of my grandparents in my 20s to cancer, mum, ovarian, dad, bowel, and grandparents, a whole lot of other things. So, you know, my, can my family does cancer really well. Um, so I guess, you know, what I learned through my own cancer experience was um, it, ga it gave my clinical practice another dimension. I, I reflected on my clinical practice after diagnosis and treatment because I was sort of thinking, oh my goodness, maybe what I do is a load of crap. Um, but actually found happily that with the exception of fear of recurrence, I actually did seem to be doing the right thing. Fear of recurrence, I learned a lot about. I have fear of recurrence. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. They're my contact details if anyone wants to get hold of me. Um, and I'll be floating around here this afternoon. So if you want to you know, come up and ask me any questions, that's fine. I'm easy to find. You can put my name into Google, you'll find me. So if you do want to reach out for any reason, you can get hold of me. Before I go any further, just a trigger warning. Um, some of the stuff that I talk about today might rattle your cage a little bit. And if it does, then I really encourage you to find someone that you trust this afternoon or tomorrow. Just have a bit of a debrief and say, gosh, that really kind of got me going and I just need to vent a bit or work through why I might be a bit upset. It should settle in a few hours, but do, do work through it if you do feel a bit rattled. This is a really helpful slide that I developed, not so much for people going through cancer because kind of like you guys probably know this, um, more actually for a lot of medical professionals because I do do a fair bit of talking to oncologists and surgeons and so on. And I think there's a bit of a common misconception about what it's like to have cancer in that like most people out there in the community are familiar with the word diagnosis and with the words treatment. A lot of people know a bit about chemo, they've heard about radiation, Hardly anybody's heard about hormone therapy, even though they really should, because um, it's so gruesome. Um, but I think there's a bit of a misconception that you can get diagnosed and then, you know, finish treatment and then kind of like, that's that. That's the end. But it isn't like that. And this diagram reflects that. So you see down the bottom in the left-hand corner, it says diagnosis, and then it winds its way through hospital-based treatment, which is months to years, depending on your situation. And then you get to this thing called post-treatment adjustment. Post-treatment adjustment begins at the end of hospital-based treatment. So commonly after chemo and radiation. And post-treatment adjustment lasts at least two years and often a lot longer. And most people have never heard of it. And quite often I get my most referrals when people have kind of finished hospital-based treatment. They start to get back to life start to kind of maybe go back to work or caring responsibilities or volunteering or study. Hair starts to grow back, start living in their clothes as opposed to their pajamas. Um, they start to like, you know, reappear. And at the same time that that happens, all the medical appointments stop. So up until then, they've been seeing people, you know, every week, sometimes every day, sometimes more than one medical appointment a day. You know, they open their diary and it's just like full of medical appointments. And then you get to the end of hospital-based treatment, you open your diary and there's not much there. And that can feel very scary. It can feel a little bit like falling off a cliff. And at that same time, because you start to then engage psychologically with what's gone on, all of the implications and what all of this means for you can come roaring at you a bit like a tidal wave. And so quite often people will fall into a bit of a hole then and I get a lot of referrals then and people come into my office on a little blue couch and in the first session I will often, after we've talked through everybody's cancer experience, I'll sort of say like there's this thing called post-treatment adjustment and this is what it is. And a lot of people are like, say what? Because their expectation is like, you know, I'm just about done. 
And I'm like, hmm, you're kind of done with a lot of the physical stuff, but we haven't really even begun the psychological stuff. When you get diagnosed, you sort of, I think, go into almost like a survival mode. It's like I've got to, like, you know, get, to, get into treatment, focus on getting to treatment, getting through treatment, managing side effects. And then it's about, you know, what's the next, treat, next treatment going to be, managing, you know, keeping stuff at home going, keeping the balls in the air as best you can. And it's almost like your psychological system goes on hold. And then at the end of hospital-based treatment, it's like somebody takes their finger off the hold button and all of that stuff, all of the psychological stuff comes flooding back in. And it's a lot. And it's a lot to work through. And it needs time and it needs space. And it's at a time then when often people around us can be like, you know, so you're good then, you know, back to normal. I'm going to talk about normal in a minute. Um, but there is no going back to normal. We go forward to a new normal. So... That's the diagram of a cancer experience. I use this analogy, the stool analogy, not that other sort of stool, <laughs> to describe why and how we might struggle psychologically going through a cancer experience. So the analogy goes that your psychological well-being is the stool, the seat on the stool, yeah? And so most stools are nice and stable if they've got a seat and then they've got a number of legs. And the legs on your psychological stool might comprise of things like family, friends, hobbies and interests, work or study, and physical health and healthy lifestyle behaviours. Now, everybody in this room probably has worked out that when cancer hits you, it doesn't just hit your physical self. It hits every part of your life. So if you had a nice, stable stool, I'm not sure any of us do, but anyway, if you did have a nice, stable stool before diagnosis, and then cancer comes along, it can do this. It can take away your legs on your stool. And what does the seat do? It tips. And so if you're feeling a bit unstable from time to time, that's probably why. So sometimes, I mean, that doesn't tell you what to do about it, but it does explain what happens. And sometimes understanding that struggling with psychological stuff with, with a cancer experience is normal is kind of weird not to because it's an existential threat. It has the capacity to change the quality and quantity of your life. It's normal to struggle. I have people going, yeah, nah, you know, had cancer, all good. It's like, mm-hmm, it's a bit of a red flag. So I'm not saying that it's pleasant, but it is normal to struggle. So the common psychological issues in a cancer experience, there's a lot. I can only give you an overview today, but KP did mention the podcast. Um, I'll tell you at the end how to find it if you want to. And all of these are covered in the podcast series. It's, it's 10 episodes. They're each about sort of 40 minutes long. Um, you're in control, so you can hit pause or hit stop if you don't like it. But um, we do go into a lot of detail about this. And the response has been incredible. I don't know what I thought it was going to do, but we're at 60,000 downloads and still going strong. So a lot of people seem to be getting stuff out of it. So, in order, diagnosis shock, emotional isolation, relationship issues, body image concerns, a perspective shift, which is when I'm going to talk about the snow globe, post-treatment adjustment difficulties, and fear of recurrence. So, diagnosis shock, D-Day, that's when I was diagnosed, 23rd of July, 2018, 5.30pm. It's like a line down the middle of my life, before diagnosis and after diagnosis. It's like my birthday now. I'll never forget that day. Yeah? I don't think anyone else in my family remembers it, but boy, do I. So it sets off this thing called fight and flight, which most of us have probably experienced, probably on diagnosis, but also maybe at other times. Big anxiety spike, which is a really norm normal experience, but it can feel very uncomfortable. It can mean that you can't think straight, mean that you feel sick. Um, you go into absolute uh, action mode. So, you know, most people, it's within days from diagnosis, they're in staging scans, they're back for multiple appointments, they're having to figure out what am I going to do with my life, what am I going to do with my work or my kids or my family, my other obligations. Um, and one of the very common responses in that sort of early week or two is a thing called information control. This is what happened to me anyway. Um, it's, an, it's an anxiety response 
So one of the things that happens when, when we have an anxiety spike is we feel out of control. So we often will behave in ways that will increase perceptions of control. And the thing I did was I went into hyper-managing information control. So for the first 48 hours, I, wouldn't, I had to be across who knew what. And I'd be like with my family, I'd be like, no, 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 you can't tell that person until we've told that person and you can only tell them that bit. And my husband was like, calm down, you know. He's a clinical psychologist, two, two psychologists in the family, too many. <laughs> you see what our children think about that. Um, and so the first 48 hours were very interesting because I was just like, I was a control freak more than normal. Um, but once it got out there, I let go of that. But it was a really good example and it made me reflect later on, this is what we do. And sometimes it's about information control, sometimes it's other things. Women typically do a bit of like nesting, so we will like decide that you know in the week or two after diagnosis might be a good time to clean out the Tupperware and that's not because the Tupperware actually needs to be cleaned out but because it increases perceptions of control. We set up a whole part of the house as the chemo suite because I didn't want to have chemo in my bedroom. Um, that was just an excuse to like you know vacuum and clean and buy new linen and stuff like that but it made me feel better. So if you have that experience it's actually a psychological response to an out of control situation. Emotional isolation is very common. There are quite a number of things that I'm talking about today that I call universal experiences, which means that they kind of happen to everyone going through cancer. And emotional isolation is best summed up by the words, they don't get it. And if you're fortunate, you might have found some people in your life who get it, what it's like to be diagnosed and go through a cancer experience. But I think pretty much everyone has at least one, one experience where they feel like, yeah, nah, they just don't get it. My husband, Robin, he's, he's a legend. Um, he gets it as close to you can get it without having had cancer. But there's still a gap. There's still a part of him that will never, God willing, because it means he doesn't ever have to get, get cancer, but that he'll never really completely get it. And that's not his fault. It's not his fault that he didn't get cancer. It's not his fault that he doesn't get it. But it does mean that I have to be careful with my expectations so I keep expecting him to get it when he literally can't get it because he hasn't been through a cancer experience, then I'm setting myself up for disappointment. And this is where empathy is so important. Going where you're understood, going to things like this, connecting to BCNA, connecting to other people where you feel like they get it. And most of us know what empathy feels like. It's like a shorthand. You don't have to tell the long story. You can start a sentence and you can see in the other person's eye that they actually know what you're talking about. You don't have to persuade them. You don't have to educate them. They know. They get it. The thing about emotional isolation is it works against us sometimes. This is a slide that demonstrates how it often works. So look up in the top right-hand corner. When you're going through a cancer experience, you feel emotionally vulnerable and you start, without even realising it, sometimes you start to seek, in your, in your mind, you start to seek for emotional support. If you don't find it, or if you are disappointed, you feel hurt and disappointed. And what does that make you do? It makes you step back, yeah? But unfortunately, if you step back, it can leave you even more isolated than you were in the beginning. So you can end up by stepping back in response to the hurt and disappointment, you can end up getting more of what you don't want, which is a really common thing in psychology. And this is hard territory because as a psychologist, you know, I don't really want to be saying to people, I want you to step forward into a space that hurt you before. And it's counterintuitive. Your brain's going, I don't want to do that. Why would I do that again? That hurt me last time. I'm not going back to that person. They let me down. But it is about reflecting sometimes, again, on the expectation stuff about what do I want and from whom? Where can I reasonably expect to get what I need? And maybe stepping forward into that space, not stepping forward into the space where you've been hurt before. But emotional isolation is a really big deal. Yeah, and often we don't have a label for it. But if you feel that sense of like, yeah, they don't get it, that's emotional isolation. So empathy, like I said before, you know it when you feel it. It feels like someone validates your experience, <clears throat> means that you feel like what you're going through is a valid experience. You don't have to apologise for it. You don't have to minimise it or dismiss it or diminish it. But the other thing to be mindful of is when you are in an empathetic relationship, 
it is important to remember that what goes for you or what goes for the other person just go for each of you. Just because somebody else has had a particular experience in a cancer scenario doesn't ipso facto mean that you would have the same experience. Sometimes when we get into like a support network, it can feel like, oh, this is so good, but like if that good thing happened to them, well, then I can reasonably expect that that good thing happen can happen to me. You've got to be a bit careful with that. Um, relationship changes. So this covers a very broad spectrum and I can't do justice to it today, but it can mean, a cancer experience can mean that there will be pressure on relationships in lots of ways. Um, it can be in intimate relationships, in sibling relationships, family relationships, relationships with your parents, your colleagues, your friends. In every way, relationships can be impacted. Sexuality and intimacy takes a big slug through treatment, but often post-treatment, and that can be for lots of reasons. It can be around things like body image concerns. It can be about physical changes as a result of um, cancer treatment. So the loss of breast tissue, changes to body like weight and shape. It can be the effects of hormone treatment. So things like, pardon my language, having a dry vagina. So there can be a lot of stuff that impacts negatively sexuality and intimacy. And there's stuff you can do about it, but the first step is to actually recognise that it is having an impact and that w where we sit with it post-treatment doesn't mean that we have to then continue. There are things we can do. There's a thing that happens in relationships, and if there are any carers in the room, they'll probably understand this, that when you're in a long-term relationship, on diagnosis, you can often go from having one relationship with your partner or your carer to having, or your partner, to having two relationships. So, for example, with Rob and I, the day I was diagnosed, that morning he was my husband. That evening he was my husband and my carer. He didn't wake up that Monday having put in a job application to be a carer. He hadn't, like, figured out, oh, that's something I might quite like to do. He didn't do any of that. He just walked out of Andrew, the surgeon's consulting room, and then he was my carer and my husband. Now, the tricky thing is that one sort of relationship's okay, so where you can be husband and wife, or another relationship, patient and carer, is okay. But when you've got two going in the same relationship in the same house, it can get messy. I will give you an example. Because you don't get hats. You don't get, okay, I'm going to wear my red hat when I'm in the patient mode and I'm going to put my white hat on when I'm in the wife mode. You don't do that. So there's no way of knowing. So if Robin said to me, as my husband, I love your veal parmigiana. Do you think, do you, think you could make your veal parmigiana? As his wife, I'd say, sure. Sure, no worries. I can do that. If he said, as my husband, I really like your veal parmigiana, could you make that for me? As his patient, I would go, are you joking? I could have sworn then, but I didn't, because <laughs> I did swear when that happened. Um, but do you see the difference? Yeah? But of course, he doesn't know, because I don't look any different when he's have, asking that question. He doesn't say to me first, so, are you in wife mode or are you in patient mode? He doesn't do any of that. Yeah, he just has to like, deal with the fallout when he gets it wrong, poor love. Um, and then the last part of, of the thing around relationships is this thing I call the sandwich generation. Because cancer, not exclusively, and I know there are some young people in the room, not exclusively, but for a lot of people who are diagnosed with cancer, it happens in our middle years when we've got both children and aged parents or ageing parents. And for people going through that, they often have a bunch of caring responsibilities that don't go away just because you get a cancer diagnosis and are going through treatment. And I call those people the sandwich generation. And that's hard because it's like they're all the people that are your loved ones. They're the people you care most about. They're the vulnerable people in your life. And so it's really hard to, like, set down those caring responsibilities and obligations and go, do you know what, I'm just not going to care about all those people until all of this is done. It doesn't work like that. Humans, women in particular, are not socialised around that. We are on earth to look after other people. And so it's a very hard road to navigate. And what it can do is it can mean that we increase the burden on ourselves going through treatment because we try to keep things as normal as possible. And that's a very, very high bar to keep. Sometimes I do reflect with my clients that children, ageing parents, even husbands, can be more flexible and can cope with 
a bit less of everything for a time, then maybe sometimes we give them credit. And it doesn't have to be forever. Sometimes it can just be for six months. And you can go, okay, you know, we're just going to have a bit more takeaway. I'm not going to visit mum and dad every day. I'm going to do it like twice a week. Or the kids are going to be picked up and dropped off by other people. But it is about being able to get flexible in that space. Body image issues. So this is a big one. And again, I can't do it justice in, in detail today. But again, it is about understanding that it's very normal to experience body image concerns after cancer diagnosis and treatment. But the truth is that the research around body image in Western culture has found that 91% of women, nothing to do with cancer, 91% of women generally in Western culture have some issue with their body image, with their weight and shape. So most of us, well before we get a cancer diagnosis, we've already got stuff going on in that space. And then cancer acts as like a lightning rod for it. Like it gives it something to zero in on. I had a double mastectomy, yeah? I've got like a, um, I'm like the girl in the magic show. I've got a scar that goes from one arm, you know, right across the other, yeah? And I chose not to have recon and I'm really comfortable with that decision for all sorts of reasons. But I'd be lying if I said I'm mad about my flat chest, yeah? I'm four years down the track. I'm a lot more comfortable with it now than I was, but it's a big deal. Um, hormone therapy was hell and, you know, I've been a thin woman my whole life and I put on a whole lot of weight, changed my, it sounds small, but I think people in the room would understand, things like my nail and my skin and my hair and my membranes in my body, all of that stuff was really affected. So there's a lot of body image stuff to deal with. One of the things that I find out about my clients is how they respond to body image stuff. It's really common when they're physical attributes that we can see. It's really common to do this thing called gaze avoidance. So gaze avoidance is where we don't look at the parts of our body that cause us distress. It's quite sneaky because sometimes you can look in the mirror. I can say to clients, like, do you look at your scars? And they say, oh, yeah, yep, I look at my scars. I'm like, yep, when you're naked, yep, look at the scars. And I say, do you really? Or do you look in the mirror but you're sort of looking at your shoulder but I, it would look like you're looking at your chest? And it's quite interesting how often they come to realise that maybe they are more gaze avoidant than they realise. If you think about across your life before maybe any body changes as a result of cancer, every time you look in a reflective surface, a mirror, a shop window, the duco on your car, your screen, friggin' Zoom, any of those times, it's like your, your brain takes a little photograph and files it in a, in a file in your mind called this is what I look like. So over the course of your life, you've got literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images called this is what I look like. And then after cancer treatment, you go and look in the mirror or the reflective surface and what you see doesn't match what's in that file. And that sets up this thing called cognitive dissonance, which is this idea of like holding two ideas in your head at the same time that don't fit. So on the one hand, you've got a file that's like, this is what I look like. And then you've got an image that says, no, this is what I look like. And it's like, oh, come on. We, you know, what do I do with that? So what you do with it is you look at yourself more which is very counterintuitive because people who don't want to look at themselves and I say to them, I want you to look at them more, they're like, oh, right, I'm going to another psychologist. Um, so I want them to look at themselves more because every time they look at the new version of Charlotte and they take another photograph, they build up a new library of images called This Is What I Look Like. Yeah, does that make sense? There are lots of triggers for body image. A bit hard to read. Being naked or near naked, swimming, going to the beach, sporting activities, so all the stuff you like to do, stuff that's good for you, great, triggers your body image. Medical appointments, showers and baths, intimacy and sex, shopping for clothes, I have fitting room phobia, oh my God, it's hideous. Um, massage, personal care appointments, buying clothing, social media and reflective surfaces. So tons and tons of triggers, so again, it, some of this is about learning what are your triggers and what's your response to it and how, and how quickly and what helps it to settle down. That's me in a fitting room. Now, the reason I took that photograph is because I was in a fitting room. That's me having a panic attack. I look pretty calm, don't I? I felt like I was going to vomit. I was, my heart rate was through the roof. 
I thought this is a really good moment because I could see myself and I'm like, whoa, what I look like is nothing like how I'm feeling. So I took that photograph and then I fled. But it's just a good example of how, how, how we're feeling and what's going on with us psychologically often has very little to do with how we're looking. The snow globe effect. I'm conscious of time. I might not get through everything, but this is a good one. So when you get a cancer diagnosis, that's your life. I don't know. Can you all see that? It's a little snow globe, like you buy in a tourist outlet. Cancer shakes up your life. All the little snowflakes are your values and priority. And when they settle, none of them settle exactly where they were, were before diagnosis. So some of the stuff that used to matter doesn't matter anymore. And some of the stuff that didn't matter before matters now. It's a very... Is, it, it's not common, it's universal. This happens to everyone in one way or another. Sometimes it's big stuff. It's like, I want to leave my job, I want to live in a new house. Sometimes it's small stuff. It's like, you know, I don't want to cook anymore. That's what happened to me. I don't cook anymore. After 25 years of doing dinner for six people every night, I'm like, I don't cook anymore. It's fab. Um, so... <laughs> Not fab for my husband, but like whatever. Um, so, so this this is really cool, but it does have. So, it, so what it means is that we we get clearer about what matters, but we also are more motivated to act consistent with that clarity. So we're more likely to prioritise our own needs. It's very cool. It can be a little tricky because if you want to make changes to your life and the people around you or the structure of your life does not support those changes easily, it can cause friction. Rob and I went through a really rocky patch when this happened to me because I was kind of like, you know, I think I'd just like to go and live under a palm tree. And he's like, yeah, I don't know how that's going to work with the mortgage, but sure. Um, and I was a bit of a different person. I mean, I am a different person, but I was even more different for a while there. And it was a bit like, God, what happened to my wife? Um, so it can be really tricky. I'd, I used to think that the snow globe effect was just a positive, but it's not that simple. It's a bit like a superpower. You have to be very responsible about what you do with it. Post-treatment adjustment, I explained before... It is at least two years. The very common thing that happens with post-treatment adjustment in, in a lot of people um, is that they want to get back to normal. And that I'll explain very briefly what that looks like because it doesn't work and we come a cropper. If that's your life, that's your moment of diagnosis. In your pre-cancer life and your post-cancer life after diagnosis, your pre-cancer life is your normal, your post-cancer life is your new normal. In your pre-cancer life, you have a bunch of expectations, standards and behaviours, keep you going, act as motivators, get you out of bed, get stuff done, works really well. But what we don't realise is post-cancer, we drag those expectations, standards and behaviours into our post-cancer world and it sets us up for feelings of disappointment and frustration because our bodies and our brains are different and we can't do the stuff we used to be able to do. Stamina, capacity, stuff is different. And coming to terms with that is a very big deal. And that's where I had a big crash. I went back to work full time straight away after treatment, nine months later, absolute meltdown. Listen to the podcast, you'll find it entertaining. Um, I went away for a month. I don't think my husband thought I was gonna come back and did a lot of writing, a lot of sleeping, a lot of exercise and had to come back and like reshape my life. Do not do what I did. That's kind of like my mission on earth is to make sure that my clients do not do what I did. I did not follow my own advice. It sounds a bit amusing, but it was not amusing then. It was extremely bad. Fear of cancer recurrence. Woohoo, we're nearly there. So fear of cancer recurrence is, again, almost a universal experience. In fact, if somebody says to me that they don't have any fear of the cancer coming back, that's a red flag because you're meant to. What we want, though, is Goldilocks fear. We want you to have enough fear that you pay attention to what's going on with your life and your health and that you do follow-up appointments and that you look after yourself, healthy lifestyle behaviours, but not so much fear that you're paralysed by and, it, and that it impacts your, your quality of life. Fear of recurrence is about, is about feeling anxious about the cancer coming back. Some research has found up to 99% of people who've been through a cancer experience have this. I have fear of recurrence, yeah. There are six main triggers, except that there are seven. Um, <laughs> that's 
good as I say six all the time. Um, so very briefly on diagnosis, as soon as you're diagnosed with cancer, what do you start worrying about? Is it going to come back? Yep. Then a new, new treatment phase, usually like when we start something new, it's kind of like, well, is it going to work? What's the impact going to be? Is the cancer going to come back? Diagnosis or, or death of a friend or a family member, with the cancer stats being what they are in Australia and often the age of people when they are diagnosed with cancer, the reality is that we're all going to know someone probably every year who's diagnosed with some sort of cancer and quite possibly other people who've died. Cancer anniversaries, diagnosis date, sometimes it's other dates, end of treatment or other big moments. Media stories, Livy Newton-John, huge, huge trigger, yeah. Medical reviews, so even when they're standard and they're in the diary and you know they're coming, it's still a big trigger, usually about two weeks out, so your brain starts to do a countdown because it knows it's coming, yeah. And the biggest one of all, and this is borne out in the, in the research, is physical symptoms. And it might be a, like a symptom that's kind of obviously connected to breast cancer, but it can be anything. I can get a headache and within like a nanosecond I've got brain mets, like actually. So it's very common to, um, to feel these triggers. I've got another slide that I didn't put in here, but essentially it looks like a line that goes up and down, up and down, up and down, because if you think, and that's your experience of fear of recurrence across a year, because if you think about those seven triggers, apart from diagnosis, you're going to have probably most of those more than once a year, which means about every few weeks you can expect to be triggered. So some of this stuff around fear of recurrence is about making room for it. People say to me, I just want to get rid of it. It's like, yeah, it doesn't work like that. I often talk about fear of recurrence as like you get a cancer diagnosis and you get fear of recurrence as a gift with purchase. You don't get to give it back. It's like the guy you didn't invite to dinner, but it's like, well, you're here now. You may as well pull up a chair. So it's like you make, you make room for it, yeah? You bring it into your life. You learn about it. You get to know it. And the familiarity makes it fractionally less awful. And that is me in an MRI machine. Um, I, I mentioned before we want Goldilocks sphere. And the, the other part to that is that anxiety has a bad reputation. People talk about anxiety as a bad thing. It's like, no, anxiety keeps you safe. You step out onto Kensington Road, which is where I practice, if there's a semi-trailer bearing down on you, it's your anxiety system that's going to like, save your life. So we don't want to turn it off. Turn off your burglar alarm, what happens? Burglars get in. So we don't want to turn it off. We just want to make sure that it's in the normal range. And you can use it as a motivator for things like exercise, self-care, healthy lifestyle behaviours and living the life that you want to live.